Grant Amato murdered his entire family for a webcam model who he never met. This is Grant and after losing his job, he became infatuated with a webcam model named Sylvie. He watched her dance and model for hours every single night and paid thousands of dollars for access to her photos and videos. He then began stealing money from his family to continue watching her videos and trying to make her believe that he was a wealthy man. At first, Grant's family tried to get him some professional help, but eventually got tired of the lies and his stealing. On January 25th of 2019, Grant's family gave him an ultimatum, telling him to either stop communicating with Sylvie or move out. And Grant's response was to shoot and kill his mother, father, and brother inside of their Florida home. The morning after the murder, Grant's brother did not show up for work, which led co-workers to be suspicious and call the police for a well check. Once police got to the family's home, they were shocked to find all three of his family members dead. When police finally tracked Grant down, his statement was, I did not do any of this. A few days later, Grant is arrested. Prosecutors state that Grant murdered his three family members and then staged the crime scene to look like a murder-suicide that was carried out by his brother, Cody. He had placed a gun very close to Cody. Four gun shell cases were found at the crime scene, but none of them matched the guns that were in the home. And ultimately, the murder weapon was never found. And on July 31st of 2019, a jury finds Grant guilty of murdering his mother, father, and brother, and he is sentenced to life in prison. Creepy serial killers from each U.S. state, part five. Texas, Dean Coral. Dean is the reason your parents probably told you to never take candy from strangers. Dean was a stranger that would lure children and teenagers into his van with false promises of candy. In fact, he was called the Candy Man. By 1973, Coral had killed 28 boys in Texas, just outside of Houston. Dean almost got away with all the murders of 30 young boys because no one suspected him. He was a straight-laced man who worked at his mother's candy factory. But one of his accomplices, Wayne Henley, turned on Dean and shot him to death. This is the devastating case of Kylie Rodney. On August 6, 2022, 16-year-old Kylie went missing at Prozer Family Campground in Truckee, California. Kylie attended a school party with more than 100 kids, but it's alleged that older people also showed up, which made a lot of the teens uncomfortable. Kylie texted her mom right before midnight and told her that she would be home in 45 minutes, but the following morning, Kylie mother got super worried when Kylie was still not home. One of Kylie's friends said that she was with her the entire evening until she decided to go home at 12.20 a.m. Police searched Prozer Lake for more than 15 hours but were unable to find Kylie's vehicle. But on August 21st, a group of divers who go by the name Adventures with Purpose decided that they would help look for Kylie. It didn't take the group of divers much time to locate Kylie's car only 14 feet underwater. The car was upside down and Kylie's body was inside. The investigation is still ongoing and the autopsy results have not been released yet. So what do you guys think happened to Kylie? Was this a tragic accident or was there foul play involved? So I'm obsessed with the dark side of Disney. And did you know there's a horrible period of accidents at Disneyland that doesn't really get talked about a lot? It's been referred to as the Disney Dark Ages. It was from 1997 to 2003 when this guy, Paul Pressler, was the president of Disneyland. Paul basically decided they were no longer going to do scheduled maintenance on rides. They were only going to fix rides when they were broken. Did it save money? Sure. But this resulted in some of the worst accidents the park had ever seen. One of the worst being that of Brandon Zucker. In 2001, Brandon Zucker was on the Roger Rabbit ride, which was already having maintenance issues. An employee put Brandon on the wrong side of the car, and when he put the lap band down, it didn't close all the way. So at one point in the ride, Brandon tumbled out of his seat and was hit by an oncoming car. The car pinned him and dragged him down the track before anyone could do anything. Also, at the time, Disney employees were not allowed to call 911. They had to call park emergency services, who then called 911. So it took a while for anyone to come get Brandon. He did survive the accident, but he had brain damage so bad, he was nonverbal and lost a lot of motor skills for the rest of his life. And eventually he passed away at 13 years old. 
Japan's killer cannibal celebrity. Known as the Kobe Cannibal, in 1981 in Paris, he killed and ate a college co-ed who was also his friend. He was declared mentally insane. For some reason, France dropped the charges, so he went free in 1986. He's become a minor celebrity in Japan. Here's his victim, and he's not even sorry for his crime. His only regret is not eating a woman when she was alive. He says that the desire to eat women becomes so intense during the summertime when they start showing more skin. Have you heard about the supernatural phenomenon that sometimes happens to people in really bad car wrecks? Well, apparently multiple people who have been in horrible car accidents have reported seeing the same strange thing. It's called the third man syndrome, and it's when a supernatural presence offers comfort to a victim during a survival situation. I'm gonna share one of the crazy stories with you now, but if you're interested in this, tonight's episode is gonna be all of these stories. So a few years ago, a Reddit user was in a horrible car wreck, like so bad they cut the car door off to get them out. They black out during the accident, but as they come to, they see a woman open their car door and get into the back seat. And the woman put her hand on the driver's shoulder and told him that it was going to be okay. And then she said that help was on the way. The user then blacked out again and came to with a fireman cutting off the door of the car. Afterwards, they're with it enough to talk to the police officers and the firemen on the scene. And they're telling them like, hey, there was this woman that got in the car with me. Is she okay? And everyone is like, there was no one in the car with you. Apparently no cars passing by had even stopped for the accident because the fire department was so close. So it was super unlikely that anyone had gotten in the car with them. But this is not the only time that that's happened. Other people have reported a woman getting into the car with them after an accident. There's so many other supernatural stories just like this that I explore in the episode tonight. So make sure you're following along. Everyone is talking about Jeffrey Dahmer, but somebody who is just as bad is Dean Coral. And you've probably never heard of him because he was never caught. But his official nickname was The Candyman. And unlike Jeffrey, Dean enjoyed torturing every single victim. Between 1970 to 1973, Dean tortured, abused, and ended the lives of at least 28 boys in the Houston, Texas area. And to locals, Dean seemed like a nice guy. He worked at his family's small candy shop. He would often give free candy to the local kids, it giving him the name The Candyman. Behind this facade, Dean was killing young boys left and right, and no one knew it. It wasn't actually until 1973 when he was murdered himself by his accomplice that all of this came to light. This all started in 1967 when Dean met 12-year-old David Brooks at the time. David came from a broken home and considered Dean to be like a father. Two years into the friendship with David, Dean began to groom him, and it was at this point that he started having him perform favors for him, let's put it that way, for money. It's then in 1970 that David catches Dean in the act of assaulting two teenage boys. At this point, Dean bribes David into silence, saying, I will give you a car, I will give you money, just keep your mouth shut. Dean then proposes to David that every time he brings back and lures a boy back to his house, he will pay him $200. David Brooks then agrees. At this point, they start to identify victims and bring them back to the house, torturing them. Along the way, David brings Dean another victim, and his name is Elmer Wayne Henley. And for whatever reason, these two bond, and that's when Dean approaches Elmer and says, I want to offer you an opportunity. Again saying, every victim you bring back, I will give you $200. When in reality, they would only get five to 10 bucks. At this point, things start to get out of control and ramp up because you have David Brooks, and now you also have Elmer Henley, who are both bringing boys back to Dean. And the only reason that this comes to an end is because one of these accomplices actually turn against Dean. This is a long story, so let me know if you want a part two about what actually happens to Dean in the end and what happens to the two young accomplices and how everything basically goes down. As someone who's watched probably hundreds of horror movies, I'm pretty much completely desensitized. But every once in a while, I come across a few horror movies that do mess me up for a good couple of days. So here's my list of the most disturbing horror movies I've ever seen. First up is an absolutely insane French horror movie that I haven't really seen anyone talk about yet. Frontiers is about a group of young thieves who are trying to pull off a robbery that goes terribly wrong. Trying to regroup, they end up at a nearby family-run motel. Not knowing that this family is a family of... 
who, let's just say, have special plans for one particular member of the group, a young pregnant woman named Yasmin. Next up is possibly an even crazier horror movie that I literally cannot stop talking about. But I realize there's still people out there who have not been traumatized by this movie yet, so I'm putting it on the list anyway. This movie is not okay. If you haven't seen this movie yet, I dare you to watch it with no context. Let yourself be surprised, it's better that way. But I'm saving the best for last. Or worse, depending on how you look at it. Last on the list is the only movie I think is more disturbing than Serbian film. Simply titled Trauma. The first five minutes of this movie is more messed up than anything I've ever seen in my entire life. By a lot. This is about a group of friends who run into the son of a brutal... This movie includes pretty much everything that is wrong with the world. Only watch this movie if you're into very extreme horror. And follow for more. Very nice, just one thing For me you are still the only dream Could be right, could be wrong This is Jalissa Thaler, and after searching her car, these police officers are about to find out that she committed one of the worst crimes imaginable. On May 20th, 2022, at 7 a.m., police would get a 911 call about a very suspicious looking car that was driving on its rims and had a blown out back windshield. The operator of this vehicle would be identified as Jalissa Thaler. The main officer who communicated with Jalissa would state that she looked extremely odd, exhausted, and out of sorts. The other police upon investigation of the car would realize that there was blood blood in the back seat. There's what? blood all over the They then would open up the trunk and be greeted by a horrifying sight that I'm sure will scar them for as long as they live. In the back of the car, in the trunk, was a shotgun and a gray blanket that was covered in blood. And upon removing the blanket, police would find the body of Eli Hart, Jalissa's son. Holy f We got a body. Yeah. All right, let's cover it. Yeah. He had received fatal wounds, and it's presumed that this happened in the car because of the blown out windshield and the blood in the back seat, as well as in the trunk. And for the murder of her son, Jalissa would receive a life sentence without the chance of parole. This is Worst Deaths Imaginable, number 11. And it's also another death at Disneyland. This was Deborah Gale Stone. She was born on June 18th, 1956. Deborah was known to be extremely outgoing, friendly, and quite honestly, the perfect person to work at Disneyland Park. She sort of embodied the persona of the happiest place on earth. She graduated high school in 1974, and that's when she got one of her dream gigs. She was hired to be a hostess at Disneyland. Shortly before she was hired, Disneyland opened up a new attraction called America Sings. This would be one of a couple of attractions Disneyland's had over the years that, uh, well, that involved terrifying singing animatronics as their lead cast. The show is basically a musical celebrating America's Bicentennial, and it was hosted by a terrifying animatronic bald eagle. America Sings was basically a carousel theater, meaning it would rotate. It had an outer ring of six theaters, and they were connected by divider walls, solid walls. And they revolved mechanically around every two to four minutes. And then there were six fixed stages in the middle of all of this where the things would rotate around. On July 8th, 1974, literally just a week and a half after this attraction opened, 18-year-old Deborah Gale Stone, who was a hostess for the show, well, around 10.30 that evening, right around the last show, as she was backing up to sort of get out of view of the show, she accidentally slipped between a very, very narrow passageway. Now, this was between a stationary solid wall and one of the rotating stage walls. 
Now, they don't know if she fell or she slipped or if she tried to jump from stage to stage, but the fact of the matter is, is she got stuck between those two different walls and she could actually be heard screaming, screaming in agony and in pain because she was literally being crushed by the rotating stage and the solid wall behind her. I mean, we're talking a very, very narrow little section that she was in. And the stage was rotating for at least two minutes, if not four minutes, constantly crushing her. Audience members reportedly heard her screaming, but some of them thought it was part of the show or that it was happening somewhere outside. But a couple other guests would inform the park staff after the last show. And when the stage was rotated for the last time, Deborah Gail Stone's body was found. Her death likely was not instant, as she was slowly crushed to death, screaming for help, but no one would help her. Her family sued Disneyland, of course, and they won a small settlement. The attraction was closed for a few days while they installed safety lights, and the attraction would close forever in 1988. It's February 2017, and a man named David Krupa hands a detective a tablet. Inside is a memory card that he thinks contains the evidence that will help them catch his stalker and allow his life to finally go back to normal. Together, they sift through thousands of deleted images, but there's one photo that is not like the others. And at first, the detective isn't quite sure what he's looking at. Reddish tones, skin, but then they see a familiar tattoo and it's this detail that begins to unravel the five-year mystery of a deranged stalker. Rewind to spring 2012. Dave Krupa is 37 years old and has just moved to Omaha, Nebraska and is looking for a fresh start. He's recently ended a 12-year relationship with his ex-girlfriend Amy, who gave him an ultimatum basically saying, you need to marry me or I'm out. Dave soon joins the dating site Plenty of Fish to see if he can find someone who just wants to have a good time and isn't looking for something serious. That's where he meets Shanna Liz Golier, who simply goes by Liz. At first, things are great. The two regularly go on dates, which are pretty casual, but when things start to become more intimate, Liz wants something serious. Dave, on the other hand, isn't quite ready to get into a relationship yet, so he tells her that he wants to see other people. In October of 2017, Dave is working at his auto shop when a woman walks in that catches his eye. Her name is Carrie Farver, and she comes into the shop because her SUV is acting up again. A few days pass by, and while scrolling on the dating site Plenty of Fish, Dave comes across Carrie's profile, so he reaches out and sets up a date. However, just two weeks after seeing each other, he starts falling for this girl, and thinks to himself, maybe I am ready for another serious relationship. On November 13th, 2012, Dave kisses Carrie goodbye, saying that he'll see her later after she gets back from work. A few hours pass by, and that's when Dave gets a text. Carrie messages him, suggesting that the two should move in together, but Dave disagrees. And when he replies no, she texts him back in all caps, FINE. I don't ever want to see you again. And soon, Liz starts receiving messages too demanding that she stay away from Dave or something bad was gonna happen. One night, she pulls into her garage and sees another message. Not on her phone, but spray painted on her wall reading from Dave. Liz's house is torched and burned to the ground. Dave is sent a picture of a body tied up in the trunk of a car, and the two both receive a fake obituary of Liz's death. Meanwhile, this consistent harassment is actually bringing Dave and Liz closer and they bond over the horrors that this woman is putting them through. One night while Dave is driving home in January of 2013, he spots a familiar vehicle in the parking lot of his apartment. Upon closer inspection, he realizes that it's Carrie's SUV, so he calls the police who find little to no evidence surrounding her disappearance. However, they do manage to scrape a fingerprint off a mint container in her car, and this DNA will become crucial later in the story. This pattern of psychological and sometimes physical torment goes on for years until Dave finally decides that he's had enough. He changes his phone number, purchases a gun, and moves to Council Bluffs, Iowa, where he's forced to end his relationship with Liz. Almost immediately after the move, the gun goes missing. After Dave gets settled into his new home, the local sheriff's department takes a special interest in his case. They request that both Dave and Liz hand over their phones so they can trace Carrie's digital footprint, but when they download the data, 
they make a shocking revelation. After sifting through images, videos, passwords, and previous locations, they discover that it isn't Carrie who's sending these messages, it's none other than Shanna Liz Goyer. On Liz's phone, they discover that she has 20 separate email accounts all being used to impersonate Carrie. As detectives continue building their case, gathering evidence against Liz, she actually shows up at the sheriff's department to file a complaint. She proceeds to claim that Amy Flora, Dave's ex-wife, is a total stalker. Cleverly, one of the officers says, if only Amy would implicate herself, meaning reveal herself to be the perpetrator, and thus setting in Liz's head a psychological trap. Now as intelligent and conniving as she appears to be, the next day Liz dials 911 and tells them that Amy Flora has just shot her in the leg. And when investigators ask for more proof, Liz forwards them several emails from Amy, confessing to both shooting her and impersonating Dave's ex-girlfriend Carrie. Liz thinks this plan is foolproof. It is the perfect cover-up. But the IP address attached to the emails, along with the countless other messages, all trace back to Liz. Further, police are able to match the fingerprint from the mint container in Carrie's car to Liz's DNA. And to top it all off, the bullet that was shot into Liz's leg is from the barrel of Dave's missing gun. In December 2016, Liz's case is taken to trial where she faces being charged with first degree murder and arson. Prosecutors say that this is a case of obsession. During the trial, Dave hands over a tablet containing a memory card. On it, a grainy picture of a foot with a tattoo. It's identified that the foot had been decomposing for several days when the photo was taken, and the tattoo was a Chinese symbol identical to Carrie's, finally proving that she was dead. On May 24th, 2017, Shanna Liz Goyer is found guilty of first-degree murder and arson and is sentenced to life in prison. She's currently serving out her sentence where she continues to behave in evil, manipulative ways not revealing where Carrie's body is and denying her family of closure. 